how am I going to follow all that? I don't know. So I just recognize that I can't, and I try and do my best. As a matter of fact, had I seen the list of participants, and in particular, the, those who were awarded the score, who got the score awards over the years, I would have told Sally and Jeff, I'll be very happy to come and sit uncomfortably in the back there and listen to the others. <laughs> because I don't think I have really much to say that uh, uh, will be of uh, importance or relevance to you, uh, to this wonderful group of uh, people. So thank you very, very much, Jeff. Thank you, Sally, for having invited me to uh, this event this year. And even before seeing all this and listening to the music and to these two speeches that we have heard, I knew that I must be, you know, uh, must be a little bit modest and remember a story of a man who came home late at night, went to bed, and uh, got up all of a sudden in the middle of the night and had a kind of flash that he had understood the meaning of life. And that it was very, very simple, really. It's just like you know, very simple mathematical formula. So he said, you know, I better write it down because I fear I will forget it. It is so simple. It has come all of a sudden like this. So he went up to his desk and wrote this formula down. He went back to bed. The morning he got up. And after a while, he remembered that he had this flash, discovered the meaning of life, and was wondering whether it was just a dream. He remembered that he, he thought maybe he had written it down. So he went to his desk, and yes, he found that he had written it down. And what he had written was, I am dead drunk. So uh, I can assure you I didn't drink anything, <laughs> but uh, I, you know I, I have to be I have to be uh, very very careful. Uh, <laughs> Jeff told you that you know I have been in conflict. I have been living in conflict all my life. Um, as a man growing up in a colony. We've seen and read about violence that had been inflicted on us. And then we started to fight for our freedom. And in so doing, we have inflicted also a lot of violence on others. Then uh, I drifted really into uh, 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 diplomacy after our independence. And I continued to live in, 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 in conflict. Then I started working on, on, on trying to solve conflicts of where others were involved. And I have gone you know, to these places that uh, Jeff has mentioned, South Africa, Haiti, Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, and all a lot of other places in Africa and elsewhere. And what I have learned in these this 20 years that I have been involved in, in trying to make peace all over the world are a number of things that I'm going to, to tell you. One is that when you deal with conflicts, obviously, you see a lot of wickedness a lot of cruelty, a lot of injustice. But you also come across a lot of kindness, a lot of courage, and a lot of forgiveness. And that makes up for that. You also, uh, I think, uh, I, I, uh, George Mitchell put it much better than I ever can when he accepted the, uh, uh, this new mission in the Middle East. 
he was most certainly, although he didn't say so, referring to his experience in, in, in Ireland, he said that you live 800 days of frustration for one day of satisfaction. You have got to accept to live those 800 years of, of, of frustration in the hope that you get to that one day of uh, satisfaction. But when you get there, you know, that satisfaction is really worth uh, experiencing. When we were in Lebanon trying to mediate the end of the civil war there, We tried and failed, we tried and failed, we tried and failed, and then on the 24th of September, 89, we clinched the ceasefire that looked like holding. And the, the manner in which to tell the people of Lebanon that now they have a ceasefire that maybe can hold was to bring a plane to land in Beirut because the airport had been closed for maybe two or three years. So we brought a plane from, from Cyprus. And the, the noise that was made by that plane, you know, when, if those of you who know Beirut know that, you know, planes fly really over the city before they land. That was a music almost as good as the one you have heard to the ears of the Lebanese. If you go to Beirut now, everybody will tell you it's horrible, these planes that fly over the city and so on. <laughs> but on that day, that was the best music that they could have, uh, that they, 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 they could have heard. So these kind of satisfactions are the things that uh, one works for. The other thing I have learned is that, yes, you know, when people decide to kill their neighbors, You know, that is, you know, that, that is, that's not, that's, that's not an easy, that's not, not an easy decision to make, to, to take. It's not easy at all. So the, the problems that take you to these situations, to these conflicts are very, very real. And as a matter of fact, conflicts are the cause of the problems you are trying to solve or the consequence of the problems that you are going to, 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 to solve. So conflicts are, 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 are terrible, are difficult, and not easy to solve. I still believe very, very, very strongly that there is no problem that cannot be solved. There is no conflict that cannot be solved. We people make these problems. We create these problems to one another, and we should be able to solve them, and we can solve them. Take the Middle East. This is the, the an insoluble problem by excellence. It isn't. It isn't at all. Um, Palestinians and Israelis will tell you that most, Palest no, most Israelis, I'm told perhaps 70%, want peace with the Palestinians. But they are absolutely certain that no Palestinian want peace with them. And that is why they think that there is, it's a waste of time to work for peace. You go to the Palestinians and you will find probably 80 or 90% of the Palestinians want peace. But they are just as certain that the Israelis don't want peace. Somebody must make these people find out that the other side also want peace. And nobody is doing that. Nobody is doing that. Quartet, the Americans, nobody is really helping the Palestinians and the Israelis make peace. And the Palestinians and the Israelis are definitely the most intelligent people, the most sophisticated people in our region. But as sometimes happen, they are incapable of solving their problems alone. They need help. And that help is not available. The day that help is really available, then you will see that this so-called intractable problem will be solved. Uh, this is, you know, the, the, the other lessons that, the lesson that I have, uh, I have learned. The third lesson I have learned is that 
uh, when we do try and provide help and support to people who are in conflict to see if we can push them towards the end of uh, that conflict. We are often guilty of the sin of uh, lack of humility, uh, not to say arrogance. We, th we think that these people are uh, stupid, they don't know what they are doing, they have destroyed their country, they are killing one another, we know what is good for them, they don't. I think that is, that, is, that, is, uh, that is wrong. What you do is really, when you go to problems like this, uh, is to see, I mean, the first effort you have to make is to understand what has been happening, what are the problems. The second thing you do is try to find common ground between the parties. There always is a little bit of common ground, even if it's a few inches. And what you do is see if you can help them find larger grounds for, 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 for themselves. And that is possible. And sometimes, you know, help comes from sources you, you, you simply cannot uh, uh, suspect. One of the things I did in Afghanistan was, uh, you may remember that in in, in, in uh, 98, 1998, the Taliban invaded all of Afghanistan. And when they arrived in the northern city of Mazar Sharif, they killed Iranians, nine of them. Uh, and they arrested all the Iranians who were in, 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 uh, in Afghanistan. So I went to see the Taliban and see if we could get these people out. The, the, I mean, of course, the, and those who were killed, they couldn't do anything except send the bodies back to Iran. But the, those who were in jail were trying to get them out because Iran had, had massed 200,000 soldiers on the border with Afghanistan and were ready to invade the country. So I, I went to see Muhammad Omar, the leader of the Taliban. And you know, after several hours of discussion, he agreed to release all the people and we took them back to Iran and the Iranians pulled back their, their soldiers. Years later, I was very proud of having you know, avoided a war between Iran and Afghanistan. Years later, I found out that uh, uh, it wasn't me. There was a young, brilliant interpreter with uh, uh, Mullah Muhammad Omar. He sent me a message, he said, you know, I would like to apologize to you. I did not translate correctly what you said. <laughs> because, you know, what you said may have made Mullah Muhammad Omar very unhappy, angry, he may have walked out. <laughs> so I have, you know, I've arranged it a little bit. <laughs> and I didn't translate everything Muhammad Omar told you. So it is this young man whom, who... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think in, in, uh, yeah. he was less than half my age, had never been out of Afghanistan. He had learned English in, 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 his, in, his, in, in Peshawar, actually. He was, he was in, in Peshawar, a refugee. And he solved this problem between Iran and Afghanistan. I did it. So one has to be, you know, to feel uh, you know, a little bit of humility. Uh, and as I said, you know, to, to listen much more than lecture. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't lecture at all. You, you listen a great deal. And perhaps out of that listening, you can come out with one or two ideas that can help the parties you are supposed to be, uh, to be helping. Um, in South Africa, uh, de Klerk and, and, and Mandela have done a miracle. You know, I have been following uh, the, the struggle of our brothers in South Africa you know, forever. And we, we did uh, you know, everything we could to help them. 
that if you had come to see me, and I, I think I knew a great deal about, uh, about South Africa and the struggle of the people of South Africa, uh, if you had come and told me it, it, as late as 1985, that five years from now Mandela will be out, I would have told you it's not possible. It's impossible. But Mandela was, was, was freed, and he and de Klerk has done this incredible uh, 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 duo, uh, uh, this incredible work. They have ended apartheid, and they have created the basis for the new, West, the, the new South Africa. But let's remember also, you see, that uh, you know, uh, we cannot be just starry-eyed and, and, and think that uh, you know, things are easy and so on and so forth. It isn't. And this wickedness that exists in the world has got to be fought relentlessly. Speaking of Mandela, I mean, just think. I think now everybody knows what kind of man he is. But just think that you know, the, the, the white South Africans have deprived their country and the world of 27 years of leadership that could have been provided to them and to all of us. So you know, wickedness is there, goodness is there, Let's work, all of us, together to reinforce goodness and fight relentlessly wickedness. Next year, I'm going to uh, teach one or two seminars in, in, in London and in Paris. And I'm going to tell, of course, you know, the only thing I know is, is conflict. So I'm going to, to, to teach about conflicts. But I'm going to tell them, please seek out these people who work with a man called Jeff Skoll and see if you can work with them in resolving conflict as well. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>